welcome everybody. Um, and today we are um, talking about, Tikva was just asking, because we discussed last time the relationship between time and tshuva, or, and more specifically, the future and tshuva. And Tikva just asked to start us off today, um, what does the future have to do with, with tshuva? Isn't tshuva, isn't repentance past oriented? Um, since we've been quoting Freud, here's, a, here's, here's the handout. We'll see what ones we want to work through, but I, I, I've always loved this quote. Um, where it was, ego, ego shall be. I, got, I, I, I know, I'm, I realize as we open this up, um, I haven't thought about this in a long time, so you're going to have to help me think about this together. Where it was, ego shall be. It is a work of culture like the draining of the Zweeter Z. What does that mean? First of all, the Zweeter's We was a very big body of water um, in, in, in the Netherlands. I, th it's, I think it's known, wor it's known th um, throughout Europe that was drained in order, I guess, to create a city. Maybe it's Amsterdam, I don't know. But the, the, what Freud is referring to is the process by which the natural world is reclaimed to build something that's civilized. Right? You get that? The natural world reclaimed. I'm going to drain the Zwieter Zwie so I can build Amsterdam, so I can build the city. Right? Um, how does it relate to this first part? What, what it, where it was, ego shall be. What does that mean? It is it the uncensored self, and ego is the censored self. So we, you know, we have our Freudian holy trinity, right? The id, the ego, and the superego. And you won't get bored of those if you understand that they're metaphors, right? Freud doesn't think there's a little man with a yellow jumpsuit jumping up and down inside your unconscious saying, I'm the id, I'm the id, right? It's a way of talking, you know, there's a contemporary psychotherapist, Jonathan Lear, who taught, he, he uses the word drives, which I think works for me better, only because it takes away all of those associations that we have with id, which make, which oversimplify Freud. Um, so, Anyway, so yeah, it's it is the drive. Hi, Mark. So the Hi. comparison yeah. here is the yeah. id to the nature to the yeah. Z, yeah. the ego to the culture yeah. that built upon it, so that we're going to mm -hmm. get rid of our basis instincts and we're able to put an ego there. That, See that? Oh, so, oh, oh, okay, that's how you read it. Where it was, ego shall be, yes. and you see that as an appropriation. The appropriation of the present self, the I of the past. Is that, I mean, so you know, you're not even saying that. You're saying the it is, the it is going to repress the it. The yes. ego is going to repress the it. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's that, okay, the, I, got the, I got that reading. This, take a, what, what are you going to say? Well, if he's saying like the draining of Zwieter Z, like that's a very specific reference. So okay. then, isn't it kind of like that it is displaced by the ego, it's pushed aside? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think, I, I think Alana, and, uh, Alana and, 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 and uh, Tigger are saying the same thing. Who is talking? Oh, hi, Kira. Shelly, was that you talking? Oh, yes. Oh, go ahead. Hi. Uh, Shelly, <laughs> when is the last time we actually spoke to each other? Ten years uh, ago? Uh, I think probably longer than that. Pro that's a, probably that's, that's amazing. at least twenty years. No, please don't say that. Wow, Shelley's okay, just—I guess you were. One, I guess you were one of my first <laughs> students then. Uh, anyway, so what were you saying? I won't tell you how old I am either. Oh, okay. um, so, <laughs> just that um, you know, building on um, what the other people were saying, that um, there's a certain arrogance in that in in the displacement of it or at least in the displacement of a natural body of water for the sake mm. of a city okay okay you guys are all reading it the same way um and i hear um i i look at it a little bit differently i look at it as the id gaining strength from its from its contact with the drives i don't look at it as an antagonistic for Freud, Freud's not a moralist. I don't read it as an antagonistic uh, encounter. I read it as an encounter by which the ego strengthens itself. 
you remember when we read this one for Shelley? Do you remember when we read um, Aeschylus's uh, uh, Oresteia? Right? Some of you may remember this. And it, it's really clear from that play that Athens is built upon blood. And the Furies, they are, they are the, they are the, the energies that first threaten the city, but then they're incorporated into the city. That's the great thing about Aeschylus, is that all of that violence and all of the, all of almost the barbarism of the past gets pulled into Athenian democracy. And that's the same thing I think what Freud is saying. Um, and, and whatever, we have to read more of Freud, but go with, go with my reading for the moment. Um, that Freud is saying that the ego gains strength when it becomes aware of those psychic energies. I mean, that is the, that's the reading. When, when it can have a creative engagement with those psychic energies. If you're only bouncing against it, it's just repetition. That's what most people do. They just bounce against it. You go and they naturally bounce against each other, right? But they're not brought into, Freud really is, is saying they'll be brought into conversation. Um, it, you, you, Freud was actually Jewish, you know? Um, it's so, um, let's continue. Um, what, what, what time, what, what time is it now? People, what time is it now? I just can't see things on my screen. Oh, there it is, 4.23, okay. 4.22. Uh, yeah. uh -huh. I was just reading Spinoza. And again, there's a philosopher here today, so I have to be careful. I'm totally quoting out of context, which I'm aware I'm doing. I'm aware I'm doing. I don't, I, and I haven't looked at this recently. I don't, know how, I don't know how much I quote it out of context. But Spinoza, like a lot of the philosophers during that period, they, they describe lots of different kinds of emotions, attitudes. So Spinoza or certainly Hobbes will talk about anger or jealousy or laughter or lots of things and define them, try to define them philosophically. So here Spinoza is trying to define sp sp uh, repentance philosophically. And, uh, Spinoza, another Jew, but his approach is certainly different than Freud's. Repentance is not a virtue or does not arise from reason. Instead, he who repents what he has done is twice wretched or lacking in power. For first he suffers himself to be conquered by an evil desire and then by sadness. Spinoza is an amazing psychologist, right? So what, what, kind, what psychological state is he, is he describing here? Why, is they, why are they twice wretched? Well, one, yeah, it, it seems like he, yeah. you know, he's once wretched for having sinned right. and he's twice and feeling bad about it. Mm -hmm. And then he's wretched again for making himself feel bad all over again by repenting. Mm -hmm. right? Repenting is just sort of wasting your time going through the same motions of this, the original sin and feeling bad a second time for the been same there, thing. Been there, done that. Like, yeah. It's like um, regret is shameful. Uh, right. Regret from, is shameful. I understand. I, I That's what I get from what he wrote. I, th I think there's something to be said about owning mm -hmm. our mistakes. And maybe uh, okay, uh, okay, we're, we're, we're going to definitely get there. I'm, we're just trying to read Spinoza at the moment, meaning I, I, I definitely want to hear your perspectives, um, but I want to do this in relation. Everything we're talking about is about this today. So we will we'll continue our conversation in relationship, a different perspective. Yes, I'm sorry, Alana. Yes, I interrupted you. Means by saying that you lack in power because mm. if you if you try and separate yourself from the mistake that you made, sort of by repenting. I see. I, I don't agree with it, but this is what I think he says: is that it's a kind of separating yourself from your deeds and and actually saying, you know, the mistakes that I made are made a part of what I am today. And that oh, is- Okay, good, good. I, I really like your normative reading and it's how I read it also, but I just want to stick to Spinoza to be able to, to understand exactly what he's saying. And I think what you said is right, that there's this, there's this double sense of experiencing the evil. I don't know if Spinoza maintains a conception of sin. I want to talk about that now. Um, 
but um, it's an evil desire still. And then he's overcome by sadness. It's the act and then the reflectiveness on the act. It's kind of like, I mean, you can imagine saying this to a friend, like, you know, come off it already. Stop sulking, right? Maybe, maybe Spinoza's talking about, you know, what Freud calls melancholy. Don't sulk. Get over it. Ever say that to people? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think he's talking about sulking. He's talking yeah. about having done something bad. Yeah, no, for Sp Spinoza, there, but there's, for Spinoza, there's the narcissism of, of, of sadness, I think, as well. That he feels it's a certain kind of nar a, a, a bad narcissism. I mean, Spinoza a very, very strong sense of free will, but the, I think Spinoza, like Freud, would see the emp somebody who defines themselves as depressed. It is a kind of narcissism. I mean, obviously, depression is an illness, right? And I'm not talking about that. But if your psychological mechanisms are telling you, and let's assume that you can use that as a a reasonable describer or definer. Um, if you're if you're always looking down on yourself, you'll just get stuck there. And 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 there's a narcissist. The way he uses the term. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Shelley. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the, the way he uses the term conquered, mm. both by um, mm. evil desire and sadness, mm. makes it sound as though he thinks the self is being inauthentic, mm. perhaps, mm -hmm. uh, or, or right. the self is being conquered, he's saying, right. which is, uh, I don't know, I find that an odd way of looking at it. Uh, mm -hmm. Does that mean that the, the self is therefore behaving inauthentically? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think, that, I mean, that's kind of what I meant by this narcissism, that at some point it becomes inauthentic. And I think that's, um, I think that's a good way of, 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 of framing it because I think, and I'm no expert and Mark, correct me if I'm saying something really wrong. Um, I think for, I think for Spinoza, authenticity is a, is a really high value. So is he advocating to do something bad and not? <laughs> I don't know. That's why I asked Mark before if Spinoza had maintains a, a, a oh, I mean, I didn't no. ask him. I asked it rhetorically in my head to Mark, whether he maintains conception of, of sin. I don't know. Um, and I don't want to get too bogged down in it, but we were, but we see that for, for Spinoza, it's a, it's a kind of form of, it's a, it is a kind of, um, it's a form of depression or just getting stuck in the past. And it's, it's not enabling. And I'm wondering- Can I add a historical note? Yes, please. Uh, really quick. Yeah. So the, Max Scheller, uh, I don't know, in the early 19 teens, I think, has an essay where he goes through a whole bunch of different negative views on repentance. Mm. I don't remember specifically if he says Spinoza, but he goes through like, mm. he includes Nietzsche. Right, well, there's uh, Nietzsche's, and, and I, might have, I might have gotten it there somehow from it being quoted. Soloveitchik quotes this, mm. this Nietzsche, right? He quotes this Nietzsche uh, and the Spinoza. He does. Probably. He, he, he probably all, gets it from Scheller. I, I was just thinking that, so that's interesting. Yeah, um, yeah and Scheller goes through this idea that you know, some people say that repentance is just fear of punishment, mm -hmm. and he refutes that. And then he goes through this idea that uh, repentance is just, it's like a feeling of hangover. You're hungover from your mm -hmm. sin, and you mm -hmm. like, feel a little sick of it. Uh, and he goes through this idea that it's a psychological malady. Mm -hmm. And so Scheller refutes all those, and he, he says, no, it's a way of rejuvenating Ex your soul. Exactly. But, I mean, Nietzsche, uh, this Nietzsche, was common. Yeah, and Nietzsche says the same thing. Fearful paralysis and enduring depression, right? It, right. it because, and it's not only a personal thing for, uh, for Nietzsche, it's, a, it's cultural, right? It, de it describes entire yeah. cultures. Um, yeah. So as we make our transition to, uh, to, uh, to texts within the rabbinic tradition, um, I wanted to go over just briefly um, what we spoke about last time, which was the, in relationship to time and the importance of the way that time gets represented on Rosh Hashanah. And that we saw that time in the Moxer, in many different places, but especially in the, in the passages on Shofarot, emphasizes three distinct times. The time of creation, Sinai, and the end of days. The second two are both associated explicitly with the blowing of the Shofar, right? And the last one is 
or and Bereshit is it's implicit. It's it, I mean it is the day of the creation of the world and we are blowing the shofar. So that notion of time, we see from God's perspective, as we said last time, God knows past, present, and future. We live in time. We we don't know the future, but we have a we have a sense of an ending. We have a sense that even notwithstanding where we are now, there is the possibility of a future. Now, I, I wanted to re-emphasize, we know you, some of you who've been undergraduates with me, you remember that I used to quote the literary critic, Frank Kermode, who talks about the tick and the talk, that time is structured. At, you can think of it in a simple sense as tick talk, but not with just two parts, but rather three parts. And there's the beginning and the end, and then there's the very, very long middle. Um, and the tick is the initiation, and from a Christian and from a Jewish perspective, it's the initiation of a, of a process that already has its ending within it. And Rosh Hashanah really is, 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 part of it is about understanding that time and understanding God, not only God as Melech in a physical way, but that God comes down into the world in, his, in a way through time. He makes himself present through time. And, that, and that's, that, that's really, I hope, I hope those of you who came to the last one felt some of that when, when you, when you, if you prayed on Rosh Hashanah. Um, because I think with that knowledge, it just changes the, your whole relationship to the Moxer. And you see also the way in which all of the different sections are related to each other and reinforcing these different, many complex messages, because it's poetry, um, in, in different ways. And it, I just wanted to mention these things here, the sound, and here's the, the messianic part, right? And you remember this, right? Here, sound a great shofar for our liberty and raise a banner together, our exiles, this idea of this messianic future. I mean, one of the interesting things about Judaism um, is that we always seem to maintain a, a notion of the future. Um, that, that, is, that is, I think, what sustains the Jewish people. That is what the korban, the first korban was about, meaning, or surviving it was about maintaining a future. And when, you know, Yohanan ben Zakkai goes to Yavna and he starts a religion which is based upon prayer and learning and not on the temple, you know, he allows Judaism to have a future through prayer and learning. Um, right. So there's the possi and we see in our own generation, the possibility somehow Jews are here, right? I mean, you, you, you know, what's that? Yeah. Do you mean a messianic future when you say future? A future that we know from the beginning, right? We don't, we might not know what it looks like, but yeah, a messianic future. Well, here we do know what it looks like. It's, I mean, it's quite clear. The beginning of it is, is quite, is, uh, is, is the gathering of people, right? Did I lose it already? Yeah, Sorry. but the future is, is very, there's, a, there's, a, there's really clear imagery for, for what that future will look like. Is, is that what you're referring right. to? Right, no, here it is. I mean, sure, okay, yeah, right. I mean, but it's the beginning of, of, of a time out of time. But so we in it? No, no, we're not in it now. We know it's coming. We, we know it's coming. We know it's coming. And because we know it's coming, it affects our present, right? We know we know it's coming. So it, it, it since we know it's coming, it affects the way we look at the present. But we've been gathered. Here we are. From uh, oh, okay, okay, fine, right. But, but we have a, a we're we've been gathered. But there's like a massive pandemic in the country, and things are not so great. So I'm not feeling very messianic at the motion at the moment. Not that I don't want to talk about. You know, yeah, we're gathered. Fine. Um, but we could talk about that in different ways, right? And I'm a and yes, I will. I put my flag outside on your mud slopes. I'm a proud Zionist. And yet, um, no, she means we've been gathered at Sinai, right? No, 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 no she didn't mean that. She didn't mean that. No, <laughs> Pam and I go way back. Um, right. Um, so we read the Moxer. And here, let's talk about a Jewish, I, 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 sorry, not Jewish, a rabbinic conception of repentance. Um, with that notion of time in mind. Okay. So this is a Mishnah in Yoma. 
and the, and the Mishnah is the, the earliest rabbinic collection of the laws, right? They're, it's written by the Tanaim, as opposed to the people who put the Gemara, the, 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 the speakers in the Gemara are Amarayim, the people who put together the Gemara, whatever, Stamim or whatever. Um, but so this is the earliest layer. And here's Rabbi Akiva, who everybody has heard of. So Tikva, are you gonna read for us just what Rabbi Akiva says? Amar Rabbi Akiva? Sure. Um... Let's read it like the poetry it is. Okay. Um, should I do the song too? <laughs> Not now, no. <laughs> okay. Yeshiva Boy Choir another time. Amar Rabbi Akiva, Ashrechem Yisrael, Lifne mi atem mitaharim, Umi mitahar etchem, Avichem sheba shemaim, Shene emar vezerakti alechem, Mayim tahurim, Utahartem. Oh, okay, 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 let's go over that first part first. Um, in front of who are you, um, what does it mean to be, be metahar something? To purify it? To render it pure, yeah. I mean, what other context is it used with in, in, in Jewish law or in Jewish, in sacred texts? I just want to know what purity the temple. means here. Right, so the temple and, um, and, 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 and vessels having to do with um, things that might be contaminated. So something that would be contaminated, I mean, death is the thing that contaminates vessels the most, right? Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to add that because I think for us, purity has a very kind of Protestant, Puritan, Christian meaning, you know? And we think of it just in these terms of somehow, I don't know, chaste or something, or pure is almost dirty in our culture, right? Um, but you know it has it has specific uh, ram specific connotations I think here. So uh, in front of whom do they purify themselves? In, I think in front of whom are they purified? Okay, good. Okay, excellent. Uh, and then and and who purifies you when it's the same? Mm -hmm. You have something. Positive. And then the pasuk said, "Did we read the pasuk yet?" And we read one of them. There are okay, Vizarak de Lechem Mayim Tahorim Vitahartem. Anything to notice about this? It's very similar to the how a person is um, purified from touching a dead body, which mm -hmm. is that you are sprinkled with water as opposed to immersing oneself in water. That's important to know. Right, which is that's that being the worst, sorry, the the contamination of a dead body being the worst level of contamination, the most difficult to get rid of contamination level mm -hmm. of contamination. Okay, good, no, right, good. Okay, so good, right. So that's how, that's how you get rid of that contamination. And, yeah, sorry to interrupt. And also, I, it strikes me as important that God is doing the purifying, right? Not I, right, right. with I the mean, water. Right, so that's, I think Mark makes it just a really important point here, especially when we're talking about tshuva, um, you, ha you have to notice things that have to do with agency, right? And Mark is just pointing that out. The agent, the subject here is Zarakti. God did it. And you were purified. Right? And that's how Tikva translated it early. In front of whom are you purified? Meaning Israel doesn't have any agency here. It's God. Well, that, that, this is the end of the chapter of the Mishnah that talks about repentance and the whole oh, oh, okay, oh, okay, thing okay. is about how you are repented, you, like some of your sins are forgiven okay, against yeah, you. Okay, fine. But so, this is what we have in front of us. Let's see what the rest of what Rabbi Akiva says. I mean, right. it's, um, not, it's not necessarily unusual for um, Atana to bring two proof texts. But again, two proof texts in a Mishnah is a lot. Right, well, in a measure, in a measure, he, it's not. But he said two things. He oh, okay, said two good, things. good, excellent, so, good, excellent. I'm just, I'm, I'm just pointing out how formally, we know that this next thing is going to be different, because there's no real reason that he should bring more than one proof text. In a midrash, it's, there was, they do it all the time. But in a mishnah, tanaim or they're, they're not, they're not. I, I don't. My experience has been they're not chucking psukim around. So, how, so how is this? How is this? Uh, this. What is this verse saying? So this, the, this is a. a short excerpt, God is the 
depending on how you translate it, either the immersive bath or the hope oh, okay. of Israel. Oh, wow, great. Okay. Yeah. And then, Mam Mikveh Metahel Et Atmehim Et Atmehim Af HaKadosh Baruch Hu Metahel Et Yisrael. That's that's curious, isn't it? Wait, so that's the, the quotation is just the three words, and then that's Rabbi Akiva afterwards, obviously. Yeah. Um, strange, no? Well, I mean, somebody said it's different. How is it different than the first one? It seems like the first one is talking about the agency and the second one is talking about the fact that the agency is being specifically acted on the collective. So Mark again is saying that we are looking at, well, agency is a factor, but in its absence, and, but we're, and we're looking at the collective. So good, right. So we are, right. So we're, we're well, still, it's, it's etchem, right? So that's, that's the people of Israel also, no? And I'm just saying the previous, in the previous, within relationship to the previous verse. Takes, hmm. It takes out Spinoza's guilt, because you don't have to repent. God just does it for you. Um, I, I, I just saw when, you know, when, when, you, when Tikva pointed out before, somebody pointed out that, Zarakti or Mark emphasize the this agency. I I see agents. I do see agency here. I mean, the action isn't described. I admit, but there is an action that has to happen, isn't there? Um, not <laughs> not to be persnickety, um, but I right now looking at the, that verse in its context, mm. and it is. The, the Jewish nation is extremely passive throughout the entire passage that okay. that okay. quote comes from. It's about okay. how God is going to redeem Israel despite the fact that Israel. Uh, doesn't well, one thing, well, one thing we know Tikva is Chazal were great readers of Tanakh, and sometimes they played around, right? I mean, they're quoting out of context. Um, but first, they have to be impure. They have to have done something. They have to have sinned. Okay, I, I don't know. Is that, a, is that a hard one to fulfill? For Israel? <laughs> right. Um, I, I, don't you have to, I don't, I may, I, maybe I've been misreading it for all these years, but I just, I see the agency that he's, you got to jump in the mix. You have to jump in. I mean, it's so clear with the previous Pasuk, Zarakti is, you know, I, that's the divine action. Now here, the action that I'm describing is not, it's not, it's not defined or delineated. It's not delineated. I don't see it, but it's implicit, I think. So I think, I think, I think the reason Rabbi Akiva says, gives Tub Sukim here is because he's talking about the complicated notion of Juva, that, that, that there is this sense of divine agency and there is this sense of human agency, that there is a sense of human agency. And that the divine, and that divine agency and human agency somehow can work together. Somehow there can be a sense of divine agency and of human freedom, which we know is not only a problem in the Jewish tradition, but a problem in the Christian tradition, a problem in every philosophical tra tradition, right? Free will determinism, providence, free will. So Rabbi Akiva is dealing with this here poetically in a way. Yeah, Alana. Well, it's dealing with two things. One is with the individual, one is with the collective. I, I saw both as being the collective. Etchem, really? uh, Yisrael. But you know, I guess Israel's given a name. That's true. That is but true. No, it says just as the mikveh purifies the unclean, that's yeah. the job of the individual. And then perhaps oh. if all the individuals oh. do this, then he, the Holy One, will purify all of Israel. So it's like I have responsibility as an individual, but also, you know, God will have 
collective responsibility or something like that. I don't know. Mm, that. That's very interesting. I, it's very interesting. I mean, there are, and I was going to, there are texts in, 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 in the Talmud in, in Sanhedrin that talks about, is the redemption going to come because of the sins of Israel or is redemption going to come because of the merits of Israel? And each one of the Amorai, they being put suking back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. At the end, I, I don't even know how it ends. They, they choose a side. But the back and forth is what's important. The back and forth that they keep on going back and forth, the side that they choose in the end is irrelevant, really. It's that in order to, in order to resolve the contradiction, you have to see both sides. Does that make sense? I can't see any agency of, of the people. It's just God's decided to purify them. And okay, so, you know, okay, so, uh, you know, I would, so you have to think then more about what this, what the metaphor of mikvah here is doing. If it's just for purification, I had that already. Why do I need that? Um, let, let's look at another, let's look at another text. Um, I'm not going to do that one. Um, well, let's do this one. Um, can I just ask you yeah. something about that yeah. previous text? How does it relate to the theme here of writing the self? We'll get there. We'll get there. Well, first of all, first of all, you know, when 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 uh, Janice is a creative writer, she's a poet. So where's where's the creativity here? Um, so thinking of things in terms of beginning, middle, and end is is mm -hmm. already giving yourself the possibility of writing. When Aristotle, you probably remember when he writes in the poetics, he talks about the perfect, the, the, what can be the perfect poetic form, beginning, middle, and end. That I have an end towards which I'm writing. I have an end towards which I'm, I'm going. And part of the metaphor that we'll use, we'll develop, is to see the way, um, and I'd let, rather do it textually, to see the way in which knowing the future can help you reread the present so you reread the past so you can write the present. Should I say that again? Yes. That you 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 go back in the past from the perspective of the future in such a way that you can rewrite the present. Yeah. And it's that that's that future you know, it's the, the nasty, the, the, the always cartoonish superego, right? Who's usually, who can be punishing, but also holds, the, but for Freud is also the ideal, right? It's the thing to which I'm striving. Um, I think, you know, and that's why uh, Tikva said earlier that mikvah means hope, it means renewal. I think one of the, the one of the extremely difficult parts of the, the 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 world that we're living in right now is that we don't really have hope anymore. Or there are many people for whom we are becoming hopeless, and people who are hopeless, people who are hopeless, I think do not. One of the ways of understanding somebody who's hopeless is a person who thinks that they don't have a future. They can't imagine a future. They can't imagine a future different from the present. And as we said from the beginning, hope. The Jewish people have lived on hope. That's what they've lived on. Well, that's why I was asking you about this idea of the future. I mean, mm -hmm. if, if, if it's just this messianic metaphor, mm -hmm. I guess you, know, you come to a question of like, does that still work for people in the way maybe so, it did in past generations? So, um, so, you know, I think, I think, I think we all in the Jewish, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, Judeo-Christian tradition, certainly from the 17th century, is defined by the, the vision of the Old Testament. And the vision of the Old Testament has lots of ethical things, but it also has a teleology. Teleology is good things are coming. Good things are coming, right? That's in, and that's, and, 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 and modern political thought is, is not at all immune from that. We believe in progress. Everybody believes in progress. Mm -hmm. One of the tragedies of, of, of this pandemic is that, um, I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought since we, I went to the pandemic. What was I just mentioning, Kara? You're, you're, you're keeping notes, right? Hope in the tragedy of the pandemic. Right, is that, that people are giving up hope. That, stu that, that there is the sense that we, 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 we don't have a future. Or we say, 
I don't know. We'll see what I don't know. History class? I don't know. We'll see, I don't know what. We'll see what happens. So without hope, there's really nothing. I mean, I, I, I just I'm really relating. I'm, if I'm not being clear enough to the, my experience over the summer and the last semester with undergraduates, who I feel, and some there's some undergraduates here, but they many of them feel like they that their futures were immediate, like they didn't have a future in particular that they could see, but it's, it was there, something was out there. And now it's like, a, there's a wall there. And I think that's a real experience. So the idea of maintaining a future in the face of that wall, that's what happened after the Korban, that's what happened after the Holocaust, is mm -hmm. after the wall, somehow to be able to, to continue to go on mm -hmm. or to see a possibility of beyond the wall. So tshuva then, as we'll see, is future oriented. We'll just look at this. This this one will 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 will, will take our the rest of our time. Um, so here's Rish Lakish, who was an Amara, not a Tani. He's a later figure. Um, uh, Tikva, do you want to read that again for us? Sure. That I I feel like I should bear a warning. I really love this piece, so I have a lot. Of okay, problems. that okay. Uh, it's okay. Thank you for that warning. <laughs> <laughs> okay. אמר יש לקיש גדולה תשובה שזדונות נאסות לו כשקגות שנאמר שובה ישראל עד אדוני אלוהיך כי כשלת באבונך. Okay, good. That 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 sounds hard. Okay, so the first one is אמר יש לקיש. Great is repentance. There's a whole list of things that make our great. There there are other things in this category. This Rish Lakish's turn. So he is, says he says that zdonot. What is this zdonot? Um, a, a sin done um, on purpose. Okay, so an intentional Delib sin. Delib deliberate sin. Yeah. And since we're going to, we already have this vocabulary, a, 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 a sin done with agency, naset lo kishkogot, is considered as a, some, what, is, what is a shogig? A, a sin done by accident. Whoops, ah, I banged okay, my shoulder so, against the light switch on Shabbat. Okay, so, there, so the idea is, um, here, great is repentance because intentional sins done with agency are made as if they become unintentional sins. And, this, and the proof text here is Shuba Yisrael, Atashem Elokecho, Ki Kashalat Ba'avonecha. Okay, as, as Tegba said, Kashalata Ba'avonecha. You failed. You failed. You stumbled. You stumbled. You stumbled in your iniquity. So, how is it getting it from the verse? All right. Um, so that's the next bit, which is no, 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 no. The next sentence explains it. Okay. Okay. Well, oh, okay, no, okay, okay, we're going to get to so, the second. Oh, okay, just, so just the first part. No, no, that's so, not the second quote. That's the explanation okay, of the first Okay, okay, so just that, go back to the first uh, thing you, you point. You over, a stumble yeah. is an accident, but an yeah. avon, the sin, that type of sin is intentional. Hebrew has a lot of words for sins. And that one is an intentional sin. Oh, good. Uh, but fine. But you're asking the question. Well, what is no, I, I wanted to ask how they learned it. Uh, you're already asking Akasha. I want to know how they learned it in the first place. Somebody brought it. That's, that's what he says. Ah. He's explaining that, but it says, the Pasuk says avon, which is intentional, but kashalta, oh, the stumble, is unintentional. So because you have returned to God, you are stumbling instead of sinning intentionally. Okay. Does the iniquity remain? Blotted out. But but even if you've done something bishkaga, there are still consequences that remain, even if it's bishkaga. No. Also, how does one act? You know, magically reverse uh, the motivation for for doing something. That's, that you sounds know, very strange you know. to me. <laughs> You know, that's one of the things that people asked about Christianity for about 300 years. It's like, how do you do this magic trick? Meaning, this guy comes into the world and he 
I mean, I, I'm just saying, I'm not saying this from a Jewish perspective. This is from like an 18th century Christian perspective. Wait a minute. You mean God got so angry that he needed a sacrifice. So he had his son come into the world and sacrifice him. Really? That's what you're going to say? Those are 18th century critiques of certain kind of Trinitarianism. I know this just because one of the things that I study. Um, um, this is a little bit Catholic. You say sorry and your sins are kind of whacked up. No, one, se one second. So the question is... They're, they're wait, wait, one second, one question. Well, I think one of the... Chuv is one of the things that is dis that, that the Chazal say. I, I also want... I want like to clear our heads a little bit here. I don't want to convince anybody of anything, okay? I don't want to convince you of anything. I just want to understand, okay? I want to understand the text. I'm not, I, don't, I don't want you to go to shul and blow the shofar, okay? So let's just read this like we would read a literary text and try to figure out what it means. What it means that, that I was asking, what, why is tshuva created before the world? In, their, in, the, in, the, in the rabbinic worldview, why is it there? I'm not, again, I'm not asking you to accept it. But in the rabbinic worldview, why is it there? So you don't go to hell. <laughs> you like watched, like, did you watch Christian TV or something when you were in, you know, in, in, in South Africa or something? <laughs> so you, so you read God. Yeah, okay, I, I'm just wondering. Those like, are two very different things. I, I'm just wondering, like, why, so why, why is repentance so necessary to the rabbinic system? Call it Judaism. If you want, you don't want that. It's it's a way out. It's uh, tshuva. Literally, is return. So, how do you come back to? Mm. If you want to call it a perfect state. Mm. Let me you ask you. Return. Let me ask it. Let me ask it in a different way. Why do Christians need Jesus? Why does Christian? Why does Christian theology need Jesus? Why does Christian theology work? Why does it need the crucifixion? Why does it need the end of days? Why does it need revelations? We just why, is it, why is Jesus, I just want to know from their system, why is it, why is it required in their system? We just Anything? learned about Ben Milton in Paradise Lost. It's I'm sure we must have. Okay. And? Original sin. God discusses it with Jesus. Okay. I, I, I'd like, to, I'd like to, you know, every time people explain things to me about Tanakh, I feel like, I'm watching a cartoon and I'm, that's not a reflection on you. It's just, I'm so, it, it, we're so, we're so satisfied with Tanakh cartoons. And it, it just, it, it, uh, it's, it, you don't have to read it. Wait, 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 we don't have to, it, you don't have to read it as a cartoon. There's a sense of the melancholy lostness of the human. And in order, this is Freud's future of an illusion, right? I'm inflecting it differently. But even in that sense of, of waiting, and melancholy, there's the possibility of a future. Again, I'm just saying that's that's the rabbinic perspective. That there is some idea, there's some hope built into the future. And shuva has to be created before the world, otherwise it get destroyed. The world would get destroyed by man's evil. You know, I have to also tell you, growing up after 1945, any of us, and I wonder if it's still for the younger people, um, we just think because there was an American world order that held things together that somehow human nature might be good. I mean, I hate to be a downer, but everything until 1945 was pretty horrendously horrible. I mean, people, just constant states of war. So, you know, we just think, oh, you know, it's everything. We have this, we have this religious progressive notion, it'll work out, it'll work out. Not so, and and uh, that's how we've adopted in the secular world. We've adopted that, that, um, that, that attitude, but without, an, without a real sense of what that will look like, without, un, without aspiring to it, you can't, you can't get to it. That's why the future is so important. The future is, it is the means through which it, it's your, asp when we talk about aspiration, I see myself, I see something of myself in the future. I see an ideal of myself in the future. Do it. It's psychological. It's political. Once you stop having them, all you have is violence. I mean, and I get, you know, all you have is violence. You have repetition. Anyway, so that's the first part. Um, let's read the second part. So then there's a question. So that we have, for, the first thing Rachel Lakish says is something you did on purpose. 
It's considered as if you didn't do it. I think it's an interesting question. Is it still a deed? Is it still an act? It's an act without an intention. It happened, but you didn't do it. Right? That's, I think that's a, re a reasonable Talmud question, right? Is, it, is a shogeg still an act? Or is it too obvious that it is? Shimon, what were you say? What were you say, Shimon? No, yeah, I would, it would say it definitely is the the, the he's he's saying kashalta. You it, you you sinned, but it wasn't wasn't really it wasn't intentional. You made a mistake. It, okay, good. Okay, good. But there are two ways of making a mistake, right? And yeah. certainly, halacha recognizes you can either make a mistake by not realizing what you did was wrong, mm -hmm. or you can make a mistake by not really having used your agency to do it. Mm -hmm. So you accidentally bump into the light switch on Shabbat versus you forgot it was Shabbat and you turned on the light. Okay, but, so, but, so they're, but, but they're both not intentional sins, right? They're both not intentional oh, sins, but they're not intentional in different ways. Uh, okay, okay, okay. One is um, using okay. agency, one is right. not. So one right. is an action, right. one is not. Right. I mean, Janice was talking before about like, you know, it's a magic trick. I mean, the Judaism doesn't require Jesus because it has tshuva. Tshuva is Judaism's Jesus, right? And, and that's what we're trying to understand here. What, what does this mean that we would say, well, we'll see what Rachel Lockyer says. He's going to build more here. Um, so here's a an, an, uh, good dole. Uh, uh, sorry? Yeah. No, I'm just saying the language is very intentional because there are different there are different words in the Gemara for, for different types of mistakes. There's shogig and onus, and then shogig usually has agency. It, it, it... Ah, okay. And so that would imply that there are, as somebody said earlier, there are some responsibilities. But anyway, there's this transformation that happens. The Gemara is now going to ask a kasha. The kasha is, what are you talking about? Reish Lakish said something different. How can you say he said both things? I'm just getting the structure of it, and then there'll be an answer. So now, uh, 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 Tikva, can you read the, the, the next one? Whoa. Wait, wait, this, that, that's a good deal, right? Sign me up, right? <laughs> right, this, this sounds like a good religion. <laughs> Um, so that means that, that, wait, wait, just so we translate it. Um, so your intentional sins, they're not, they're not, they're not, ren they're not rendered null. They're, they're like, here's the real magic. It's, it's Star Trek, right? There's, they're turned into something different. They're turned into merits. Go ahead, and we have a different proof text. Right. <laughs> No, but it's daka. Ah, but daka alehem yichia. Sorry, I missed the last word there. Right. So daka alehem yichia. So what? Let's just read that. And when the wicked turns from his wickedness, and does that which is mishpat but tzedek, alehem yichia. On those he shall live. You see how it's learned. You oh. see how Rachel Dukish is learning the the pas the pasuk. Right. He is. He will. He's learning. Alayim, on your sins of the past, you shall live. Right. I mean, right. So you see, and right, this might not be the Pashtut, right? But Rish Lakish is a good reader. So he's pulling it out, right? He's using it for his own purposes here. So here, yeah, go ahead. It's worth pointing out that Rish Lakish is someone who came to Judaism in, in a late stage of life. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Therefore, oh. had significant experience with Chuba. Okay, which... so, right. He's a, he's a Chuba. He's a Chuba guy. Um, Right, he's a great, he's an interesting personality in the Gemara. Um, right, and this can be read as either somebody, you know, somebody looking back on his own experience mm -hmm. and saying, okay, this is how my sins appeared and not. On the other hand, it can also be read as very self-serving. Mm -hmm. I'm cynical. I, I, Mark, we've just met and I can tell you, I can tell that, I, I've seen that. Um, yeah, I think I, 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 I'm always, cynicism is very, very attractive to me. Um, so I'm always, I'm always in danger of ending up there. Um, but I think the pshat is that that he will live upon them, that he will, he will uh, thrive sustain upon, himself. sustain himself. That's what I think the pshat is. So the Gemara, so that's the kasha. And then, so, uh, wait, so, kasha, wait, wait, so I, the, I just want, I'm going back to my yeshiva days where I had to repeat everything 9,000 times. So there's, um, the first thing that he says, Rish Lakish says is that, that that um, 
tshuva takes something you did intentionally and makes it as if there were no intention. And the second thing he says is that intention, he takes the bad thing you did intentionally and makes it a merit. It actually works to your benefit. So how do we, so the question really isn't so much on how it works in the second one or how it works on the first one, although we will get that answer in the process. The question seems to be formal. He said two different things, right? How do we, how do we, how do we judge it? And what's the tarots? Uh, and they say, La Kashia, this is not an issue. Kan me'ava, kan mi'yira. These are two different types of chufa. Okay. So we'll, the way we'll answer this question is we'll be able to say that there, one is out of love. Who out of, uh, who's out of love? One, one is chuva out of love. One is, you know, doing chuva from a desire to be close to God. Okay. And one is out of a desire to not be punished. I think that's what Yira, what Yira is in this situation. Though I, okay, I could go, okay, good, 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 good. So let's. So that's there's actually two. what I was. Sorry, go ahead, go ahead Jonathan. Go ahead. Uh, th um, th that's actually what I was going to ask. It, to me, it seems logical that if one does chuba, therefore the um, the uh, zdonot and the what was it? The zdonot become. Uh, um, because you're doing tshuva, so therefore it, it makes sense in a way that your, your agency kind of changes, uh, but to turn them into actual merits um, is a little odd. But uh, so what, sorry, so what, I'm losing my train no, of thought. No, it's fine. It's, it's very easy to lose your train um, of thought. I've, I've done it many times before. <laughs> um, um, there, was another, there was another like thing I was going to say. Um, well, so let, let's just... Uh, let, oh, I, yes, yes. Right. What, what if the motivation... So it says uh, um, either ava or mi yira, from love or from fear. Mm -hmm. But what if the motivation for the chuva is neither? What if it's just done because you have to or you feel that you have to? Well, and it's not that, well, really that's fear. That's fear. sincere. That's fear. I'm, uh, what? I don't know. Yira? You're... you're you, uh, okay. Well, yira yeah, I mean, implies you know okay. fear of God, right? Okay, what if you have no fear of God? What if what if you're just, uh, just following fear of, the motion? Fear of religious society, I think, also counts as a kind of yira. For sure, it does. Yeah, definitely does. It does, even though it's like totally inauthentic. But yeah, yeah um, it's a very scared of religious society. Oh, so listen, I, I really, I really want to stick to Rachel Lakish. Okay, so Rachel Lakish says here. So we learned, we learned, the, we learned the verse. It says. One is miava. I don't understand. I, you're all talking about this. I don't understand it yet. One is miava and one is miyira. So miyira, why? So let's do yira first, because that's the easier one, I think. And maybe you already said it, Shelley, and I'm I, I didn't follow entirely. So so what happens? What does yira do? You said that makes sense, right? That you're in a way you're taking away the gift of chuva is something that you did in the past or something you did in the present. We won't count as a sin. Because taking, your agency has changed. We're taking right, oh, you, you, oh, I see. And that's what you chuva did. You, say, you basically say, and that's what, and why chuva has this metaphysical force here is that I look back in the past and I say, that wasn't me, right? And we say, okay, that that past person wasn't me. Well, isn't isn't it a bit? Oh, like, I, 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 I like that formulation a lot. So I'd like I'd like just to breathe it in, right? that this kind of tshuva, um, I, I think, you know, I think, I think tshuva miyira looks a lot like certain kinds of Christian atonement, or not, um, you know, that it just happens. It's like a divine, it just, it's a divine thing, right? You, you see before Rabbi Akiva, there, there, there are two psukim he's bringing. One is divine agency, one is human agency. All Reish Lakish is, now Reish Lakish here is talking about different kinds of agency, what agency does. So here we see that, that, um, the intentional sin, we're, we look at you and we say, or we look back in the past and we say, no, it wasn't me, I didn't do it. Baruch Hashem. But don't you have to say it was me, but I'm sorry that I did it? Okay, so good, right. Now that for sure you have to do that. And if you did, if you sinned against somebody, then you have to apologize to them explicitly. There's a Mishnah right before that, that the sins of, of God are forgiven, but sins of man, that's not my problem. You better, you better make it up to people. Um, so, so, so here we're talking about um, looking at the past. Really, is thing I just got. I just got to get away from that. I'm disgusted by my past. Right? I can't believe I did that. 
I think. I think well, hold on, just one second. Just hold on one second. Let me hang your hand up. Guys, 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 I'm having a class right now. It's not recording. Sorry, guys. Sorry. One moment. With the intention. Are you can still hear. You can still hear me. Yeah. Um. So uh, my, my the minor household dis disruption. Does that happen at your house? Are there disruptions at your house ever? Never. <laughs> yeah. yeah. My um, son so regularly. Gave, I gave you a chance meetings. to think then. How is this, how is the relationship to the past different with Chuva Miyava? It seems like what it's saying is that if you do Chuva Meira, then your past sins oh, become I'm not hearing you guys. I'm, so, I'm sorry, I wasn't hearing you, Mark. I, I had oh. my sound off. Yeah, go ahead. Oh. It seems like it's saying that if you do Chuva Meira, yeah. your past becomes Shogeg. Because there's a different retrospective agency. If you do tshuva me'ava, well, it's a retrospective it lack, like, lack of agency. We said a retrospective lack of agency. Okay, right, okay, right. Okay. The, the 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 agency has shifted retrospectively. Okay, but if you do it me'ava, yeah. it becomes meritorious, mm. not because there's a different agency, but because there's a different motivation. Mm. Mm. Does that sound right? I, I think so. I mean, I, I mean, I'm not sure what you're trying to emphasize. I think it's formally right, right? So, I mean, that's what we're talking about, the different motivation. So Mark is saying there's this idea of agency that maintains there. I did, I did it on, I mean, I did it on purpose. And now I'm going to change why I did it. Why I did it. Well, I think... I just remembered a, a, a high school interpretation about this that might you're be not, good. You're not, you're not obligated to share the high school interpretation. No, it's good though. Okay. Um, I, at least I think so, which is that when you do Shuva yeah. um it's kind of like uh, muting a sentence. I think that's what they call it. Okay. Um, whereas um, when you do Shuva Mi'ahava, it's saying like, I, you know, by by doing tshuva, it means you are working hard mm. to um, to return to God because it's important to you, and so that means that you've worked harder on that because of this sin you have you have labored for your relationship what, what, with God. What is that? What does that love consist of? What is that love? I think that might be one of the hardest words to define in the English language. So, is it easier in Hebrew? No. Well, is it love for the self or love for God? Ooh. I think that's. I think. I think it's both. I think it's really both. Um, and one thing allows the other. I think. Am I? Still oh, wait, 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 wait. I, I just like. I'd like to sit. I. You, you can I'd like to sit on that one a, l a little bit for more, more for as well. Or that, neither. I mean, it could be love for oh, something more abstract, right? Love in a more not directed at someone or something. Uh, okay. Right? I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to go with love as well. Love is as love is an activity, an activity that's directed, and and love always has to be understood in the Jewish tradition. I think as an activity, not as a thing. The activity of love, it's kind of like faith. Um, I mean, maybe in love, I don't know, in some ways it's related to faith, but it's its the possibility of, of this form of attention that you're giving to the divine. And I think what's happening in, in this, again, from this rabbinic perspective, I'm asking you not to personalize it, but to understand it. From this rabbinic perspective, 
Ava means the, the power of this love, the love for the divine, is that God allows you to love yourself in such a way that you can reinterpret the past in such a way that it allows you to have a present. So the relationship, okay. wait, wait, so the relationship between past and present, id and ego, is not like we said before, like this, but it's one in which the love, the way I'm able to look at myself, and here the model is not, that wasn't me. Here the model is, that was me. That's the model. And it shows, and it's the divine recognition of the ambivalence of human action. And that some things, not at the moment, at the time it did it was bad, but that divine ambivalence of human action, that there was always a part of the action, some part of it that was able to be reread in my present. Now, how do I reread it? That's, that's why the future is all important, the tick for the hope. I, have, I, I aspire to something. That aspiration, that aspiration gives me the means through which I can re-narrate, tell that story again. We tell this, that's why writing tshuva, we understand the writing of, of the story, the writing of tshuva is that, oh, that happened in the past and now I'm gonna go forward. The story of tshuva doesn't work, it doesn't work in those causal terms. The, the, the present transforms the past. The, 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 the future transforms the past. What hasn't happened transformed the past. You can say it doesn't make sense, but that's true. But that's why, it that's why it exists in the rabbinic world. Because it's the only thing that allows humans in some way to, to go on. Here, here is, I, I described Freudian mourning earlier. This is saying in the face of depression, in the face of the sense of the, the irredeemable, I don't know, materiality of the self, of despondency and despair, even within that, you can, there's, there's, there's a hope. And, and it's in a way, it's built into the system because the rabbis acknowledge derech atevet won't happen. It's just like we started with Freud. Freud says, well, you know, let's try something else. And if that doesn't work, well, I'll just go back to believing that people are really stupid and they're driven entirely by their desires. And guess what? Chazal basically think the same thing. They, they, that's, I think, their assumption as well. But they have a system through which that can transform. And that's when Freud writes about cultural transformation, um, he bases his cultural transformation on the idea of the psyche. And Rish Lakish here is talking about not only the psyche, but also the Jewish people in general. There's a possibility of going back to the past and re-narrating re it. Any memoir writer does this, right? Any good memoir writer does this, right? A, a memoir writer who thinks they're gonna just tell what happened in the past. You know, let me see your scrapbook, right? Memoirs are creative activity. That's a good memoirs are. Good memoirs are not only creative activities, they're activities in which you see and feel that activity. You, that's what makes a memoir readable. When you, feel, when you feel the author's activity in making herself. Of, of taking the traumatic past and, 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 and writing it. Writing. This is all we, this, I mean, I do, I do teach creative nonfiction. And this is all we talk about, not in these terms, but all, all we talk about. So I think the difference between, so another difference between Spinoza and Nietzsche is for, for uh, oh, you know what, here's, here's the guy I wrote a book on. Let's finish with this. I wrote, a, we have, definitely have to finish with this because not only have I written a book on this, but Mark has also written a book on Soloveitchik and it is a coming attraction, okay? So Rabbi Soloveitchik, for those of you who don't know, was a great rabbi of the past generation and a half or something, really created American orthodoxy in some sense. He was a religious thinker, a philosopher, as well as a halachist. And he writes, and he wrote, he writes tons on repentance. Mark is also, is read that your book is coming out when, Mark? Soon. We can hear you, but soon. Okay, oh, so I'm guessing early 2021. 
Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll look, we will, I will look out for it. Therefore, the creative gesture of which man is capable cannot be reconciled with our common sense notion of causality. When the future participates in the clarification and elucidation of the past, points out the way it is to take, defines its goals, and indicates the direction of its development, then man becomes a creator of worlds. It's interesting, so Lejik is kind of taking the Nefesh Chaim and internalizing it, for those of you who know the Nefesh Chaim. Um, so I think Solveitchik just said what I said, right, but much more clearly. When the future participates in the clarification and elucidation of the past, how is that done? Creatively. Points out the way it is to take, defines its goals, and indicates the direction of its development, then man becomes a creator of worlds. Man molds the image of the past by infusing it with the future. See, I use, I use the metaphors that he did, right? I, but that's not bumping up against. You can talk, Freud, I, Freud, Freud's notion, Solveitchik's notion of repentance and Freud's notion of sublimation are very close to each other. I mean, they're obviously different, but they're close to each other. Um, man molds the image of the past by infusing it with the future, by subjecting the was to the will be. Where it was, ego shall be. Here it's where it was, super ego shall be. The future imprints its stamp. Freud and, and Soloveitchik are not contemporaries, but rough contemporaries. The future imprints its stamp on the past and determines its image. The cause is determined by the effect, moment A by moment B. Only the present and future can, I love this metaphor. He wrote this in English, it's good. Only the present and future can pry the past open and read its meaning. That is the meaning of the past is not known in its fullness. You don't know what it means yet. You don't have that, you're, you're, you're building a, a new self through which you'll know what the past means. It is the future that determines the direction of the past and points the way. The future transforms the thrust of the past this is the nature of that causality, operating in the realm of the spirit of man as a spiritual being, if of the spirit, if man as a spiritual being opts for this, for this outlook on time, time as grounded in the realm of eternity. That's why I started Rosh Hashanah. I mean, I didn't, haven't read this passage in a long time, but I started Rosh Hashanah, right? And emphasizing that sense of, of time and time being grounded in eternity. And that notion of teleology for this shape of time for all of human history becomes for Soloveitchik the shape of psychic time. Past, present, and future. Which book is this from? Uh, you, I don't even remember anymore. Mark, do you know? I don't know. What, there's a book called Repentance. I don't think it's there. Maybe a Lachit Man. Probably a Lachit Man. Can you, can you give a, a, an example? Can you give a... a, a practical example of how you can mold the image of the past by infusing it with the future. Can I, can I, any, does anybody, does anybody want to help me? You, you look back at your past and knowing your future, you see your past differently because you, like you look back on a choice of a career path and knowing your future, you know if you made a good or bad decision in the past. Is that what it means? Or psychoanalysis, psychotherapy. You look at your past and you understand your past. You understand your present. That, we're, not talking, we're, not talking, we're, not, we're not talking only about the act. We're talking about your identity. Uh, has it ever happened to anybody that they went through a time in their life which they thought was unredeemable hell, and then at some point later in their life, they're able to look back on that and narrate it? Isn't that the basis of all memoir? Any other, any other memoir I don't want to read, right? And if you're going to stay completely in the past, then, you know, go see your therapist. And if you're going to be a bad writer, then don't bug me. But if you're going to do that, if you're going to go back to a, if you're going to create a new past and pres a new past through your future and present, I'll read that. Not really creating a new past, just seeing how your bad past can help your good future or that it's all going to work out okay. I, th I think it's also built here on the ambivalence of, of intentions and actions that sometimes we don't see the things that are in them. We don't understand the actions fully. We don't, I really think, you know, you go through a really bad time and then, and then you blame yourself, right? You blame yourself. You think this is, 
all my fault. And then you go back and you are able to re-narrate it and see, oh, I don't know, I'm not that person. Or there's another side of me that was there then. It was there then, it just, it wasn't the part of me that was really active. Chuva, chuva is chuva is a a it is it is Judaism's notion of psychological health, an idea that you have an an ideal for the future. That future helps you process your present. You don't repress it. You don't push it off. And that present that that aleim yichia through them you will live. Through those past things you will live. This is Jewish psychic health. I, 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 don't want, I don't want to hear about what, how communities are psychologically unhealthy. I know this, but I don't care about that because I'm, I don't, I, I don't they're, they're morons, but this seems interesting to me. And if your past was good? <laughs> so you can, you can just help others, <laughs> which is what you do, Pam. So. <laughs> Wasn't it Kerouac who said that, you know, confession is better than therapy? I mean, you know, I don't think, I don't think repentance is, I mean, to me, I find, you know, the liturgy, as I said on, on Rosh Hashanah, is much, so much easier and more beautiful than on Yom Kippur, right? A confession, it, I mean, what the difficult part about confession, I guess, is that you're given these generic formulas, which are somehow meant to, to have some kind of relationship to your emotional experience. And that's, that's hard. That's hard. But there, is a, but, there, but there is a sense, and we saw this in relationship to um, Rosh Hashanah. We said in Rosh Hashanah, there's that emphasis on call, call shofar, the call of, you know, we're, we're not up to dibur. Yom Kippur is Dibur, so Chazal, whatever, the people who made the Sidur, the, mak the Maksar, they, they give you the words. Here, here's Dibur. Mm -hmm. but, I, but, I mean, I, but, I, but I think also there, there is that idea, even in conventional ideas of Chuba, what is it? You have oh, Karata, uh, you, you regret the, you regret the past. What, what's the other thing you do? <laughs> when you, you acknowledge the sin. Or you acknowledge the sin, and then you and you make and you and you and you have a an idea for a, a, a future plan. Which exactly what and, and you confess. <laughs> and you confess. Well, yeah, we're, that's exactly the three things we're talking about, right? You go back to the past and you regret it. In the present, and in the present, you say, "Oh, that's that's what that was." You name it, and then you have you have a, an ideal for the future. Well, you know, I, the the way I defined it is much less important than the form of it, that past, present, and future are in dialogue with one another. And when they're not, you just have repetition. I think when you talk about tshuva, and I think mm. I might be wrong in the religious sense, mm. the Jewish religious sense, I think you're talking about actual sins that you've committed, not just regrets that you chose sure. the wrong. Right, so, you're right, right, right. But I did so, something really bad. I did something really bad, yeah. I did something really, really bad against what God would have expected. And it, right. I, have okay, to sure. I have to say something very, very interesting to me yeah. and very contemporary. Can I say it? Please go ahead. Can I say, um, that I read that one of the top rabbis of the Haredi community, when asked why the pandemic was hitting them, mm. said that people who don't know that they're sinning, like the secular, don't know that they're sinning. Right, Pam, 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 listen, you know, we spent, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you because we spent six months talking about bad theology. Haredi, you know, I don't want theology from the newspaper. We read, no, no, we, we, no, we, read, we read Milton, we looked at Rembrandt. We know what good theodicies look like. Are people morons? Yeah, but that doesn't stop us from being intelligent or trying to be. No, but it's I, about Chuvan intention. Ah, go, I, go ahead. Finish up then. No, you have to know that you're sinning in order to um, do Chuvan mm. on the sin. And maybe that's what it means when you, mm. when you finally do it for love or for fear. Mm. When you finally find out that you've done the sin, 
Mm. then if you sorry about it because you've accepted with love God's mm. Um, mm. God's overwhelmingly good presence, that might be a better tshuva than when you just say, "Oi, I better be sorry because otherwise I'll go to hell." Okay. But the the whole point of secularism is that there is no hell. So no, yeah, when you guys, guys, that, yeah, okay, guys. I, I really, I, I really, I mean, I'm grateful for the perspectives, but I, I am, I having a hard time just understanding clearly what's in front of us. Um, I, I just don't want to. And, and fine, and I'm interested in your perspectives, but I, I, I'm not interested. In that, you know, we started out today, and we, we're finishing now. It's, it's very late already, but we started out today talking about the way in which we have so much noise in our heads. It's it's almost impossible to think, right? You don't want to read the news anymore, right? Just it so impinges upon you. It's like you don't even hear it anymore. It just activates a part of your brain that makes you anxious. So for me, this is like an oasis, right? I, I just want to I want to read the text. I don't want to bring in, you know, the the perspectives that impinge upon me all the time. I think there is a certain sense, Mark, you're a philosopher, I don't know if you agree with this, that there is a sense of like the, philis- the necessar- necessity of withdrawal to do real serious thinking, to, to be alone. I mean, I know Mark has, you know, you, through this, Mark has written several books with collaborators. So maybe you're not the best example and collaboration is great. But for me, I just, I, I, I've, I've, for me, the opportunity of this pandemic has been to, I mean, it's horrible to say, right? But to, to, to find that space more for myself. I wouldn't have to choose our collaborators wisely and you don't, right, you wanna separate the noise from the, the sound. And, right. Uh, that's, that's but I think it's very hard to find a good collaborator because as Freud says, most people are driven by their desires. And I mean, I've edited books and I just, it's, it's, a, it's a nightmare. You're just dealing with lots of different personalities fighting with each other. Right. I mean, so it's rare to find a good collaborator. Yeah. I think it's interesting that you're using the metaphor of writing for all of this. Mm. It's very interesting because, you know, I, I knew you like as a, as a lecturer of like 10, 15 years ago when you were much more religious. And no, my, no, I wonder, no, right, Janice, Janice, you're wrong. I'm much more religious yeah. now. I'm much more <laughs> religious now. So you fooled me. <laughs> I, 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 might, I, might I might have fooled myself as well. But perfect, that makes it okay, more- perfect example, right, about how tshuva works, right? Because mm-hmm. I could look back on that and say, oh my God, how did I do that? Which I did for many, many years. I stopped doing that because I like who I am now. And you're right, it's not, I didn't rob a bank. You're right, so maybe it doesn't apply. But that's what Soloveitchik and Freud are talking about, right? Narrating yourself. Right. And I, I'm not, you know, because you can imagine people and that's why people people very often they are chuva, right and they can become very very extreme and then they become very very extreme and then they stop being religious altogether right i'm mm-hmm. grateful that i had the internal resources for that not to happen right mm-hmm. yeah and, and and now i feel and now i really feel you know m- i'm much more in tune with it's interesting for me now because I haven't really studied. I'm, I'm learning much more now than I used to, but I haven't really learned in a group of rabbinic texts, and it's fun for me. I spent a long time learning rabbinic texts. Guess what, people? You know, believe them or not, the rabbis were really, really, really smart. Right? And if you think they're being dumb, chances are you're just not reading it carefully. It's like Shakespeare and Milton. You know, I mean. I'm not going to say Lahavdil as they would in a yeshiva setting because you believe it more with Shakespeare and Milton. You don't say Shakespeare made a mistake. You say, why did he do this? Right? Same thing with the rabbis. Anyway, <laughs> that was fun. I, 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 was, I was thinking of, of, of doing, like once the year starts, a, a regular thing on Midrash or something. Maybe we'll think about doing that. I'll write it to people. Yes, I, I thought you might be interested. The question is anybody else, and nobody has to say so now. Um, but but thank, you, thank you very much for letting me talk, talk about this. Did anybody else want to make any comments before we end it? And, you know, uh, please, feel, I'm not going to be insulted when you leave, so you can leave. Um, anybody have any comments to wrap things up?
Shimon, are you thinking something? I can see your, I can see your, 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 the cogs of your brain moving. <laughs> and then nothing specific. Uh, Salvechik also does write on on the um, the mikveh and and the and the sprinkling of the water. He he makes the same distinction uh, that you brought up uh, at the beginning. I, I really haven't seen that. Um, so he thinks there's, he didn't think there's a distinction in agency. Yeah, yeah. Okay. He specifically nice. talked about that. Good. 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 I'm really, what I'm really encouraging through these talks, and for myself as much, is to appreciate everything we read first as strange. Wow, that's strange, right? Who would write that and in what context? Because when we see it like that, ah, then, then there's, there's, there's less of a chance we're going, to, uh, we're going to immediately evaluate it and reject it. You know, we started with Spinoza and Nietzsche. You can read people and not be transformed by their thoughts. It's okay. You're allowed to do that. Right? Don't be afraid. You know, find with, you know, yeah. No, I just want to thank you so much, Ilana. Thank you so much, Ilana. Really you're, enjoyed you're it. So, you're so religious. Gemar Chatimah Tovah to you also. <laughs> Another metaphor of writing, right? I mean, we didn't even get to that, right? Books, of, By the way, Books of Life, one, one of the, the primary, um, uh, one of, a, main, a Rishon says that it's all metaphor. Book of Life, not, you know, we written in the Book of Life, not written in the Book of Life, it's all metaphor. It's Sadiq and Rishon, it's metaphor. Like he's saying, don't read the cartoon, right? The cartoon is there for children, right? That's why we have the little Midrash says. <laughs> but we hope we don't go through our whole lives reading the little Midrash says. But what makes it very fabulous yeah. for me mm -hmm. is I, I agree with you that you have to get to grips with the text, but you have to understand what it's, the text is saying. You have to, you have to be able, for me, I have to be able to understand exactly what it's saying and how I, not how I, Matt Pamela, can relate to it, but how people can relate to it. Mm -hmm. So we you should, what, so what wait, 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 so I, I would, I'm here, I'm going to be normative. You should never say what people, how people can relate to it. The question, what, is, how, the question is not how people relate to it. The question is how you relate to it, right? I mean, and unless you're, unless you're, associate, it, unless you're associate, and you know what? In this conversation, you can in 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 a, in a school of sociology. But if I'm now being normative and talking about the rabbinic system from within its context in which I find myself, then the question is never to ask what people think. The question is okay, all, the question I is think. always to ask. I didn't read didn't read Adam Phillips. No one can be better at living your life than you. And okay, that you and and that you. is wait that is a chidush. He has to say that. He has to say that because. Not that it's not obvious, but because we don't think about it. Because you're right, Pam. We all, the, the, our society is dominated by herd thinking. It's not mm -hmm. new. It ain't new. No, We're but you have to understand what the text, like if, when you talk about from love or from mm -hmm. fear, you, you have to think it through aloud. What does it mean? Like you do. You can't just say this is the text. I'm a, you have to understand. I would never say. I, I, I would never say that. The text is always going to be our understanding, and you're right. There's always there may be more than one understanding, sure, and but we'll, the, but the understanding will will have to it, the, the text itself will have to hold that, right? It will have to be able to accommodate that, and we have ways of you know going back and forth and discussing it. Mm -hmm. That was very interesting. Thank you very much. Good to see you, Janice. Thanks for coming. Okay. All right. Bye. Very, Bye. very interesting. Good. Okay, so everybody, shall